Okay, hi everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are gonna get started. Thanks for uh, throwing your profession into the chat so we can see what everybody does. Um, we are just, we're so happy to see you all here um, and we are so excited to be here at our second live Financially Empowered Women event. It has been a lot of fun watching this community grow over the last month. And we've really enjoyed talking with so many of you in the Facebook group and through emails. So thank you all for participating and especially thank you for being here tonight. For those of you who were not here last time or just as a reminder, my name is Megan. I am the podcast producer here at White Coat Investor and I am your host for these few events. Um, I'm personally super excited about our topic tonight. White Coat has been trying for the better part of a decade to get us all to put a written financial plan in place. Um, it really is a cornerstone to building wealth, and it is not something that I have always had. And I just, I can't tell you the positive and powerful impact that getting that done has had on me and on my partner and on our overall financial well being. We'll get into all of that later, but I'm just so happy to see you all here, and I'm just excited to learn about and talk more about this super important topic. Um, so we want to start out with just a couple of um, updates, reminders of upcoming events. Our next virtual event is going to be on January 17th. Dawn Baker is going to be talking to us about finding our own unique work-life balance. And then following that event, we have another virtual event coming up in the later part of April. Joanna Turner will be educating all of us on all things taxes. So Joanna is a CFP and a CPA. And as you all know, April is a wild month for those folks. So we are super grateful to her for fitting us in and making time for us. And so we're still nailing down when that's going to work for her. Um, but she, as soon as we get that information, we'll send that out to you and it will not be uh, too long from now. So another exciting thing that we have coming up is our first ever in-person uh, FEW event. And that is going to be happening at WCICon this year. So the FEW will be sponsoring a women's happy hour. And we cannot wait to meet what we hope is many of you in person. Um, something else that we've been wanting to do just from our side here at WCI is make sure that all of you know all of the amazing women that work here at White Coat. And, you know, these are the women who've contributed to creating this amazing community. So over the coming months, as we have these events, we are going to be introducing ourselves to you. So we're going to start with that right now. Um, we're going to turn the time over to Chrislyn who is our conference director for just a couple of minutes. And she's going to tell you more about WCICon and the few happy hour that we're doing and just what it is that she does for us here at White Coat. So let's hand it over to her. Thank you. Okay, there we are. Hopefully you can all hear me. Welcome. It is great to be back here. Hopefully some of you that were with us last time at this few event are here again tonight. I'm always excited to see who's here. And like she said, my name is Chrislyn Wolston and I am the conference director. And um, these pictures kind of say it all. I like to do the fun stuff here at WCI. I don't have a background in finance and I'm not a doctor. My husband's not, but um, I do have a really great passion for the mission of WCI. So I actually have been in events for 15, 20 years. I, for about 13 years, was in the corporate world doing conferences and traveling um, just having incredible experiences. And I've always kind of had a love for that. And the reason for that is I found at a very, very young age that I love the value that I found when people came together and experienced something together. It was always amazing to me when you have like dedicated time and space and all the other distractions were away, just like what I saw could happen for whatever mission it was. Um, but I'm currently in a stage of my life that probably a lot of you are in. If you're here, I found in this group, a lot of us are in the stage of balancing a couple kind of straddling two different um, seasons of life per se. So I had many years where I was full-time career, but I'm now also managing a motherhood and a home and a family. And so a few years ago, I had to make that decision of kind of how to do that. 
And I decided to back off the full-time corporate world and really dive into motherhood and found that I really do love to use my strengths and my talents and to work. And this opportunity came to do a part-time job. And so I've jumped on that. And so for the last four years, I've been with WCI part-time and being able to focus on the annual conference, which has been a great opportunity for me to kind of... um, learn that balancing act, which I know a lot of you have been talking about in a lot of our discussions. So with that, I'll just say it's an honor to be a part of WCI. You've probably all seen now, especially you've been a part of few, you're getting to know more of the women that are a part of WCI. And I would just say it's such an honor to be a part of this company and a part of this mission. Um, so that's a little bit background of me and kind of my role. Um, diving into the what the conference is, hopefully you've seen, you've heard, we're kind of talking about it a lot right now. But if you haven't, let me just give you a moment. These pictures kind of say it all. So WCI Con started, um, you know, probably six years ago. And we're on our third in a row since we took a little break pandemic. We did a virtual event, but we're back in person. And it is what this says. We are looking to give you an opportunity to focus on balance between strengthening your wellness and also your financial goals. And at WCAI Con, we have so much good content for you. We have incredible speakers. Our speaker that you're going to hear tonight is also one of our speakers at the conference, SC, and um, among many others. But what our goal is and what my job gets to be is to work really hard to create an environment for you to take that content and actually have it um, kind of, I always say, marinate in it, giving you an environment where you can marinate in that. You can kind of figure it out. Our goal at WCI Con is that you can come away with your next step. You can find a community that's going to help you with that next step. And you can feel like you can thrive in your goals. And so we create that experience. We not only have three days full of content and incredible speakers, but we also want to take care of you in the wellness area and in the networking area. And so we're going to be at a beautiful resort this year in Orlando. It's our first time to Orlando. It is a Monday night through a Thursday. So it's a great opportunity to kind of come the weekend before a lot of you are bringing your family we've already heard from or kind of come and then stay for the weekend it's a great destination and then when we get out of classes at four o'clock every day we have just stacked it with activities that are all included in your registration and so this is one of the parts where I feel like the magic happens so we will have everything from yoga pickleball 5k runs they actually have a fishing pond there we have golf the driving range Uh, the list kind of goes on with that And then we'll lead into happy hours, networking, dinners. And like um, Megan mentioned, this year we are having a women's happy hour again, which is always the most popular event after hours event. And this year, the few will be sponsoring that. So it's a great opportunity to come and meet each other and um, really connect face to face. So we have decided to give all of you a great discount as well. If you're not registered yet, we have a $200 off discount, which we're going to share with you. Um, It is the few if you haven't registered yet. We're just going to have that through the weekend. So I believe, Megan, we're just going to send that out to everybody as well. But take note right now, if you type in the few when you register, you will get $200 off through Monday. Uh, Most importantly, we don't want you to wait any longer because we have some really great swag. That is something we kind of take pride in. We give away incredible books. We have some sweet swag, um, but we only give it to those registered through November 16th because we need time to order all of that. So now is your time. It's close enough. Hopefully you can get work off. You can connect with your family, figure out your plans and join us at WCA Con 24 in Orlando. So good to meet you all. Hope awesome. To see you there. Thank you so much, Krislyn. Really appreciate it. And obviously, I work for WCI, so I'm biased, but I love this conference. It's such a great week. Um, it really is one of my favorite weeks of the year. So if you're on the fence about this, take the leap. Come join us. You won't regret it. And it's going to be particularly special this year, I think, just getting to meet with all of you and have like a real community of women that are building something together. So, um, okay, let's get on to the presentation portion of our night. So last time that we met, we talked about identifying 
our goals and our values and aligning our spending with those values. And I hope you got to take a couple of minutes over the last month or so to really identify what your values are, because that's going to be really critical in building a financial plan that you can both stick with and believe in. So after the presentation, just quick FYI, we're going to spend about 15 minutes doing a question and answer session. So if you have a question while SC is presenting, please throw that into the chat, and then we will do our best to read all of those out loud and um, have SC try to answer some of those at the end. So I am so excited. I'm so thrilled to introduce our presenter tonight. You may have heard her on the White Coat Investor Podcast or seen her speak at WCICon. SC Gutierrez is the founder and CEO of Aptis Financial. She is a CFP, a business owner, an educator, a wife, a mom to three beautiful children. Not only is she a Harvard-educated, brilliant, hilarious, fun-loving, and hard-working woman, but she has an absolute heart of gold. And I'm just, I'm so happy that we get to learn from her tonight. So without any more from me, let's turn the time over to her and SC, take it away. Oh my gosh, Megan, thank you for that really kind introduction. It is such an honor to be here. And do I get to come to the happy hour? Absolutely. (laughs) You have to be there. there. (laughs) And so we can talk about finance, uh, financial plans, or we can not talk about financial plans, but uh, I hope to see you all there. Okay. So this is really about building a financial plan. And uh, I know that sounds um, a little ambitious in a 30-minute period, but I am so excited to present this in a 30-minute period because I want you to understand this can be done in a more actionable way than a lot of people think. It's more attainable. So what we're going to do is go through in the order that I think is important for building a financial plan the critical steps of it. We're going to go through how to identify what your appropriate savings rate is. Now, I saw everybody coming in. I saw the names. I saw um, I, I saw what you all do. I saw that there's already someone who has reached uh, FIRE. Congratulations. Um, and that's really what this is about. So um, whoever that was uh, that, that announced that, this is probably not going to be as useful to you, but a lot of times it's really awesome to have folks who have achieved this and uh, this might just resonate and reinforce what you've already done to get there. So I want that for everybody here on this call. So savings rate is like 90% of what you have to deal with and we're going to get through that. Um, So then figuring out, okay, so you've got this bucket of savings where do you put it? Um, A lot of people think, oh, I start investing. Oh, not so fast. We have to figure out how to stretch that money, leveraging the tax code. So many people um, get a sticker shock when when they come out of residency and get their full first full year of uh, what I call big doc pay. And they realize that the taxes alone that they're paying can be higher than their salary as a resident or a fellow. So we want to really make sure that we're leveraging that in all of our available tax efficient buckets. And then finally, after we've chosen our saving, our appropriate savings rate, I've re- gotten to our tax efficiency and our be- best tax buckets, Then we start talking about investing. And what I'm going to do here is we're not going to go through necessarily the, you know, what's a stock and what's a bond, but I'm going to give you the very practical thing that you just need, which is in each of those buckets, how should I invest? So you'll see these slides are going to be available to all of you. This literally will walk you through step-by-step how to build this plan. You can pull out an Excel spreadsheet and you can start putting numbers to it if you want. You can get a, you know, tablet and a, and a pencil and build this. And it is that simple. And I'm telling you, it will work. Okay. So the interesting thing is whenever I come to, uh, to, to speak to any group or when anybody ever, you know, wants to have a meeting, it's interesting because a lot of people will say, I just really need to know how to invest, how to invest. It's like that there's this universal FOMO out there that all these people are getting wealthy because they're investing really well. Well, the thing is, is investing can help you build wealth, but it won't build it because you have to have money 
in order to invest. And that is where most people go wrong is they just don't have enough money and no investment return. Even if we, even if we really believe that we could somehow win in investing, beat what the average market is doing, which you really can't, the stats don't, don't pan out. Even if we could like think how much we would have to make up um, for a lack of savings. So that's why we're going to really focus on what is actually going to make us wealthy. It is saving. So what I'm going to talk through here is a very simple plan, and this is a pay yourself first plan. So I think a lot of people, you know, just time after time, so we we specialize in people coming out of training and starting their first jobs, uh, you know, making their big dog pay. So that's those are the clients that we typically see. And what I think is interesting is talking to residents right as they're coming out and contemplating making 300,000, 500,000, 700,000, a million a year. I think it, there is this idea that somehow all this money is just going to flow in. And because they've been living on 60 or 70 or $80,000 a year, that somehow there's just not enough imagination to be able to spend all that. And so we are able to to help people understand what's going on in the brain. It's not happening uh, in the prefrontal cortex. This is uh, adaptation level phenomenon is happening um, in some very different areas of the brain. And, at, and there is really, there are very few people that are immune to it because what's happening is, is you can come out making that big million dollars a year and without a really solid plan in place can be living paycheck to paycheck. And if I didn't personally see it, I wouldn't have believed it. And a lot of people, when I when I say this, they're like, well, huh, let me try. And I'm like, no, don't mess around with this um, because it is very, very real. And so you might be one of those people though, you know, you didn't get this, you know, you, you, you didn't, you know, learn these things as you were getting out of training and you might be backpedaling. You might have to, you know, you, you might be in a kind of paycheck to paycheck area or maybe not able to save the way you want. That is okay. Um, that is my story. I was in credit card debt, lots of student loan debt, and uh, went from being a net spender to, uh, you know, now a 35, 40% um, of gross saver now um, with my husband. So you can absolutely turn things around. Um, but what I love is for folks that this is kind of their first on the journey, imagine this. If we can set up a very simple system where you, instead of saying, oh my gosh, all this money is just going to pour out the bottom because I don't know what I'm going to do with it. And then every month or every quarter, I'll just shove all that money into savings or whatever. It doesn't work that way. I want you to take the money out first. And I think most people are open to it. So it's really funny to me whenever I meet people um, who are uh, coincidentally all saving the same amount. So for instance, we do retirement plans and so we'll do them at healthcare organizations. And so sometimes I'll do physician only presentations and I'll come in and talk and then I'll meet with all these physicians and come to find out they're all coincidentally saving the exact same amount. And whatever it is, it could be 22,500, it could be double that. And what's interesting about that is they're basically maxing out their retirement plans because it's easy. That's where you put your money. But then because they haven't done this work to figure out how much they need to save and where to put it, then they're basically not saving anything else. And so they're all saving $22,500 and then essentially spending the rest. Okay. So very much most people, if, you, if you're a physician, saving 22,500, most likely you're going to be under saving. So this is what we see. So imagine if we know that this is true, there could be this massive coincidence out there that all these physicians are just saving 22,500. Then you realize, wow, saving can be kind of arbitrary. So why don't we make it arbitrary on our own behalf? And let's get the the amount that we think is going to help you retire when you want to retire. Let's get it out just the same way a retirement plan scoops out these physicians' money every single month. Why don't you do that for you? This is what I want for you. I want you to pay yourself first and then pay everybody else. So we're going to talk about the simplest system to do that.
So you need to always have a plan and a system to carry out this plan. So this is your Excel spreadsheet. Start it at the top or your tablet. Start it at the top. How much am I going to deduct from my gross pay that is going to leave my check or immediately get withdrawn out of my account every single month? This is where you're paying your future self first. We can do that through retirement plans, which we're going to talk through, or student loan repayment, debt reduction. You might have come out of residency with credit card debt. That is an amazing way to pay yourself first is to pay that down. Next, we want to save for future expenses. I meet so many people, so many physicians who are like, yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it's always working. I have everything on paper, you know, where I'm paying myself first into my retirement plans, but then I always end up in credit card debt, but I don't understand. Here are my bills and here's what I spend. Well, okay, that would be nice if that's all we spent every year. But the thing is, is you have to account for owning a home and the repairs that go with it replacing a car every 10, 15, 20, 25 years, whatever it is, however long you want to drive your car. We have to save ahead for these things so that we're accounting for them within our budget. So we don't land in these debt cycles that we see so many physicians get into. And so then you're accounting for those expenses. So you're paying yourself first, knocking that out, getting all those future expenses that you anticipate um, needing to have within the next three, five, 15 years, whatever they are, um, figure out how much you need to save on a monthly basis for them, getting those out. And then essentially you can spend whatever is left. Folks, that is your financial plan. That's it. Four steps. When we build these financial plans, yeah, we have a big Excel model for folks, but you know what? It's built on these four fundamental principles. Pay yourself first, save for future expenses, account for all your bills, spend the rest. It is a very effective system. So, you know, it's interesting. I don't take it for granted that everybody thinks that you ought to build a financial plan. Um, and, you know, sometimes people are either kind of uh, just, you know, don't think one way or the other about it. Um, and some people just think, you know what? I work too hard. I make money. I don't want to have to deal with this. And so I get it. Um, but I want to make the most solid arguments. So these are my best reasons for you to consider this pay yourself first system. First of all, there is nothing that can replace a feeling of security for your future. Um, I think Megan was exactly right. That is a feeling that you get when you build and you know the plan, you've built it, you're sticking to it. Um, it literally can take all of the stress that finances can have. Isn't it amazing that finances can be stressful or not? There's a lot of things we can't choose in our life to be stressful or not, but you can actually set up a financial plan that will, you know, aside from catastrophic things that can happen with your finances, it, you can be pretty sure that it's going to take away the stress. Um, imagine if you had confidence in the spending that you choose. A lot of times I think people like will go get, you know, go buy a house you know, like a million and a half dollar house. I mean, $1.5 million house. And it's kind of like, oh, I really hope that's going to work. I mean, literally, I think so many people buy houses like that. Um, well, gosh, these other doctors in my practice are buying a house like that. I mean, I should be able to. I mean, imagine the stress in really not knowing if you can actually buy that house. But imagine if you had confidence in I just bought those new springy Nike shoes that everybody's talking about. That's helping people win marathons. I just bought a pair today. I know I'm confident I can buy them. Um, imagine if you had confidence in everything that you bought because of this system. Um, imagine having flexibility in the immediate, immediate term. So many people think, ah, just, I don't know. I'm, I'm more of a live for today kind of person. I, I don't want to like think, I may not even live till I'm 65. You know, I meet a lot of people like that and I get it. Um, I'm a very much live in the now person, but here's the thing that's cool about a financial plan is that if you build a financial plan that's built for the long term, you will see that over time, you're going to have flexibility in the immediate term. When you start building these pay yourself first savings accounts, when you start saving for these intermediate term things, when you have an emergency fund that allows you to leave a practice that's toxic, when you have a, um, a college fund that's fully funded, and then when your kids go to college, you're like, have fun, I'll come visit you, and uh, you get to turn off the savings. 
uh, that, that is money that then goes into your life that in your 50s, maybe, can already start making your life more comfortable. Or a lot of physicians I meet say, hey, I want to get to the point where I can work part-time. I can flex for a little bit and then go back to working full-time. Having savings, having uh, not only savings in retirement, where you're kind of pre-funding your retirement, you're building it from the beginning, you're 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 getting it, uh, you're you're aggressively building it from the beginning. When you have these emergency funds built, this is what it allows you to do. And I have seen physicians do it, and it is incredible when it's something they want to do to have the means to do it. Finally, imagine if you grew up like I did with very negative emotions around money. I have I have practice avoidance. That's what got me into credit card debt. That's what got me into student loan debt I didn't need to get. When I was getting my master's at Harvard, I should know better, but I didn't. But I had so much negativity around money that I was like, I'm just avoiding, I'm avoiding, I'm avoiding. And that is how all of these things built. And then it just becomes this this negative spiral. Imagine if you can change your money story simply by having a financial plan and then trusting yourself over time as you are uh, as you are are working on that financial plan. Okay, this is the moment. I would say this is the slide. Okay, this is it. Um, and I don't typically like to have a lot of things on a slide, but this is your ability here to kind of start honing in on what your savings rate ought to be. Now, there are lots of ways for you to find your ideal savings rate, but uh, this is a good way for you to start kind of getting a general idea of how much you ought to be saving right now. This is that amount of money that you're going to be taking out of that gross pay and throwing it into the buckets that we're going to be discussing. So this is your pile of money for future you, okay? So here's how I want you to figure out how much to save. So first of all, if you take the top row, what we're trying to identify here is a very simple multiple, which is how much money do you have right now? Now, if you're just coming out of training, it's probably a big fat zero. In fact, it might be a negative number, right? Because you might have student loan debt. Great. You're going to just stay very simply in that first column. But let's say you're kind of mid-career and you've built up some money. I want you to add it all up. I want you to add up all of your retirement accounts. I want you to add up all your brokerage accounts. Don't include 529s because that's not going into your retirement. Anything you can identify that, yes, this is money that is going to support me in retirement. I want you to add it all up. After you've added it all up, I want you to divide that by your gross pay. That's it. That's it. Now, let's say you're married and you plan to stay married into retirement with this person. Well, you probably need to put them into this categories, into this equation as well. So add up all of your money together. Add up your spouse's uh, nest egg and then divide it by both of your gross pays together. So this is, this is your pay before you've taken anything out. So this is the, I just negotiated a $500,000 salary. That's the number I want you to use. So there is how you get your multiple. So let's say you have a million dollars saved in all of your retirement accounts and you make $500,000 a year. So the million dollars divided by the 500,000 means you have two times, your nest egg is two times your household income. So you're going to stick in that two times um, income column. Now, luckily, picking your age should be fairly easy. You just want to pick the age you're kind of closest to in these five-year increments. And then you can see So if I am, you know, let's say I'm 40 years old and I have two times my income saved in retirement, then you can see I need to have about a 20% savings rate. Now, sometimes people get confused by this chart and they think that somehow they have to keep increasing their savings rate. But here's my point. The coolest part is if you don't procrastinate and you adopt the savings rate right now, you get the ability to maintain that savings rate for the rest of your working career. Now, there's one little caveat here, um, and this should probably not be in the fine print, but this assumes a target retirement age of 65. I don't want to work until I'm 65. In fact, I I bet I'll work until I'm 65. I just don't want to have to work until I'm 65. So if that is you, then we need to maybe consider being a little bit more aggressive So maybe we want to have this financial independence retire early mindset where it's like, you know what, 
I want the ability to retire by the time I'm 55. So let's take our same exact scenario. We have a million dollars saved. We make $500,000 a year. We're 40 years old. This might seem crazy to you, but I want you to consider, could you get to a 40% savings rate? Now, here's the cool thing. When you're 40 years old and you're looking at age 55, that's only 15 years away. That is not crazy. It is not crazy to say, I can kind of taste retirement at 55. Okay. So I will take any questions on these two charts. If any of you have questions on this, I will answer them as long as you want. You will have my email address. You can ask me any questions on these. This is the most important decision that you will make tonight. I hope you'll make it tonight. And I hope you will not delay because let me show you. Let's go back to our age 65. If you delayed, let's say you're like, mm, this, this is not a good time. So I'm going to put this off until I'm 45. You go from needing to save 20% to 25%. And if anybody's doing some math on their on their calculators right now, that is a really big difference in saving. Okay. Now, let's say you've got your savings rate. You're going to do it. And I believe you're going to do it. Because remember, it's going to be the first money that's going to come out of your checking account or your even your paycheck, even more ideally. You know, you can do that. So where can you go wrong? I will tell you where you can go wrong. And if you are saying to yourself, when you're doing the math on what it would take to hit that savings rate, if you are say, saying, there is no way, my guess is there's one thing standing in your way, and that's your house. That's it. It's the house. This is what's standing in people's way, especially people who live in really high cost of living areas. So I will tell you this. The chances of being able to hit one of those savings rates is going to be better if you can have a home that the entire house is less than two times your pay, or at least the amount that you're financing. That is going to allow you to hit that savings rate. If your home is more than that, I challenge you to figure it out to find a way to get into a more affordable home. Next, remodeling. Remodeling is the new car. People are like, oh my God, people buy all these cars. They're so expensive. Yeah, they do, but that's not where the real expense is. Constant remodeling. It, it is unbelievable. The upgrades, the, the cost of them, a new deck for 70,000, replacing the kitchen for 80,000. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on, the landscaping, the adding a pool, like I've seen it all. And it seems like once you start remodeling one area, it's really difficult to stop. And this is a massive change. So I'll see people who say, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to get to that savings rate, but we got to we're just doing a huge landscaping in the back. Uh, once we get that done, we'll hit it. Oh, and then two years later, we're still not there. And now we have to save more in order to hit our ideal uh, retirement. And now it's, you know, a different piece. This is what is happening, folks. Um, a really expensive travel budget. Now, I'm a huge fan of a travel budget, but sometimes we see it's not the one trip. It's the multiple, multiple, multiple trips, the luxury uh, the luxuries that are added onto it that can just make a fifty or sixty thousand dollar travel budget and really encroach on the savings rate. Private school. I mean, I've got to get into private school. I got to a public and one at private. We had to make that decision, but it it came at a cost because it's ex extremely expensive. And so this is a matter of finding what your priorities are and making sure that that decision for private school does not impede your savings rate. And then there's health and beauty. So uh, it is amazing to me the nickel and, or it's not nickel and diming. I call it the hundred dollaring. The hundred dollaring that is happening in the health and beauty uh, markets that I think are making a lot of women, especially, we are just going broke on it. I mean, we can get Botox and lashes and uh, microneedling and massages. I mean, like it's, it's wild. Like the self-care industry, it's amazing and I love it but it is making us broke. And so we have to actually make decisions about this if we're gonna be able to hit that savings rate. Every time I'm tempted there, I think about, am I willing to give up the ability and the flexibility to retire on my own terms? And typically I'm not. Okay, so 
we now know we've got our savings rate and we know that there are things that that are preventing us from getting our to our savings rate rate right now. A lot of things that Katie talked about in, in the last session, we are just going to have to find our priorities so that we can maintain that savings rate. Next, we have to figure out where to put that money. Okay. So this is the second priority. I don't want us to get confused at all. The first priority, how much we're paying ourselves first. The second priority is tax efficiency. Where are we going to put that money? Okay, I am going to fly through these buckets because here's all you need to know. If you have this slide in front of you, you can literally take your money and max out how much you can put into each of these buckets following what we call the tax efficient waterfall. This is the priority of where you will put your money. And we're going to go through that right now. So start with where are you getting free money? Typically, when you go work for someone, you're going to get free money in a match. Max that out. Make sure you are always taking advantage of free money that is coming to you by entering a retirement plan. And it is amazing. Yes, there are physicians who absolutely do not enter their retirement plans and forego the ability to get free money from that. If you are entering a retirement plan to get the free money, please consider using, this is where I told you I'll give you the investments that go with each of the buckets. Please consider using a target date retirement fund. A lot of people think they're lazy choices because oftentimes you are defaulted into these funds. But folks, there is nothing lazy about a fund, a mutual fund that buys the underlying mutual funds on your behalf that typically capture the entire U.S. stock market, capture the entire international stock market, and capture a good representative sampling of the bond market. And they'll do it in an allocation that is based on your age and your time to retirement. So it's actually doing it in a very smart way. I use target date funds because I simply cannot be as efficient as they are at making sure that I am constantly in an appropriate allocation for my age. And I think my age is what should determine how much I have in stocks and bonds. Next, pay down any high interest debt. Folks, This the, the age of the saver is here. The age of the debtor is officially gone. I, in my adult career in finances, it's been 20 years. I've owned this company since 12 years. This is the first, I would say, six months that I have actually been able to say that confidently because we have always battled the behavioral benefits of saving versus the financial benefits of using OPM, other people's money. Folks, it is now time to use your own money and pay everyone back because they are probably charging you too much interest. Pay down your credit card debt. If you've got student loans, get on, on a good path if they are high interest to getting them paid off or getting public service loan forgiveness. Next bucket, max out an HSA. It has a triple tax advantage. You don't pay taxes when you put your money into a health savings account. You don't pay taxes when you take it out as long as you use it for health expenses. And you don't pay any capital gains tax because folks, yes, you can invest your HSA. You can max out that bucket. You can put as much money as your company says you are allowed to put into it. And you can actually grow that money. Most of them have target date funds as an investment option. You can grow that money in stocks and bonds, and it will be your only money that you will ever have as an adult that you won't pay taxes on it. Imagine that kind of leverage. And so then if you're doing this strategy and you're saying, well, gosh, we have health expenses. I need that HSA. Yes, you have health expenses, but you don't need the HSA. You can set up your own just regular savings account that you can pay for your medical expenses out of so that you don't have to raid your HSA. Again, use target date funds there. Then go back to your retirement plans. So you might be at a practice that offers you more retirement plans than your 403B or 401k. You might have a 457 plan available to you because you're an academic institution. You may have a non-qualified um, 457 plan. Consider using and maxing out these plans. 
Next, you can open up your own Roth IRA and you can do what's called a backdoor Roth. Don't know what that is? Google it. You're going to find White Coat Investor. You're going to find Position on Fire. You're going to find amazing tutorials on how to do this. But you can actually set up your own Roth IRA, manage it on your own, and guess what? You can use a target date fund in that as well. It's amazingly simple. Set it and forget it. Then finally, if you are still have money, you have maxed out these buckets and you still have more money, don't stop. Keep going. You can open your own taxable brokerage account. It has never been easier to be an individual investor and doing this on your own. We have I have built a practice that is built around helping people do this on their own. And I'm telling you, regular doctors who have day jobs can do this. So you can open one, Vanguard, Fidelity, or Schwab. Just call them up and say, I'd like to open a taxable brokerage account. And you can literally buy those same funds that you can find in those target date funds. I actually show you, here are the funds you want to buy. This is what's going to represent everything that are in those target date funds and your retirement plans. This is them. You can ask them, hey, how can I buy the total U.S. stock market? How can I buy the international stock market? They will help you buy these funds. And guess what? It gets better. I'm going to get to that in just a second. So finally, the last two buckets. Let's say that you have done your uh, all of your 20, 20% savings rate in our past example, and we got it into our taxable brokerage account. But then you're like, but you know what? I'm kind of addicted to the saving thing. I only need to save 20, but I want to save more. Well, this is where when people are like, well, where does real estate come in? Or where do these other kind of venture capital or angel investing or in, women's investment clubs, where those come in? This is where they come in. This is that bucket, okay? It's the extra money because it's the money you can afford to lose. It's the money that you can experiment a little bit more with. It's the money you buy your individual stocks if you're like really interested in stock picking. This is the bucket you would do it in. And finally, in, uh, pay down low interest debt. So uh, this would be low, low, low on the totem pole. Let's say you have a home that right now has that two and three quarter percent say, uh, interest rate. Man, I wouldn't be fast to pay that off, but maybe this is where you could consider adding a little bit of extra money. So the key with all of this, the key with every one of these buckets is figuring out how you can do the work. This is your financial plan. It's not on paper. This is where the financial plan, actually the tire hits the pavement, is you figure out how to get the money physically out of your check and deposited into those buckets. Because until you do that, you do not have a functional financial plan. I have seen the most beautiful financial plans that have been made and never execute it. If you do not take this step, I don't consider you having a financial plan because we studies have shown we can only be motivated for three months at a time on anything. And so if you're going to go on sheer motivation and grit, chances are you're going to stop making those deposits. Okay. So this next step cannot be overstated. I want you to physically set up automation from every into every single bucket so that you every single month have money going into your retirement plan. That's easy because the company sets it up. Into the HSA, typically easy because the company is setting up. Uh, set up auto payments into your credit card payments. Set up automated everything. You can even automate into your taxable brokerage fund uh, brokerage account as long as you are buying mutual funds. And that's what I was recommending as those four funds to buy mutual funds so that you can automate the contribution from your checking account into that brokerage account and then automatically purchase those individual mutual funds. Isn't that incredible? You can literally set this all up and then sit back and that financial plan will happen on its own. Just revisit every month or every year. Okay, now, so we've just paid ourselves first, folks, the most important part of our financial plan. We have taken the money, we have gotten it out of our paychecks first before we spent on anything else, and we threw it into those buckets. So I would say, take a victory lap here. 
But if you're interested in that four-step system that I talked about, here is step two. This is the one where you prevent yourself from, yeah, maybe being a saver, but then ending up in debt, credit card debt cycles, okay? If we can save ahead for all of these are the major expenses that I see, you may have other expenses to add. But if you can get money physically into these accounts on a monthly basis that will accurately pay for them, and, and we'll get to that, to, to your best guess, then this is going to actually prevent you from ever rating on rating your savings rate, i.e. bringing it down, and it'll prevent you from using very, very expensive debt. Folks, I cannot overstate this. The age of the saver is here. You are not going to go out and buy a car with a car payment because right now interest rates are 9%. You start doing the math on that, a $30,000 car, the difference between saving ahead and uh, and financing it, saving ahead for five years, financing it for five years, folks, it is $10,000 on a $30,000 car. Rinse and repeat on a $70,000 car. You must consider saving ahead for every single purchase from now on, at least until interest rates, uh, if they ever do come back down. Okay, so I suggest opening separate savings accounts. The research on mental accounting is really clear. We are terrible at estimating how much we're going to, how much in one savings account should be allocated to each of our expenses. You need an emergency fund. You need a home repair reserve. And I give you some, some math around that on how much I would put into an emergency fund, saving ahead for those out-of-pocket healthcare expenses so you don't raid your HSA, um, saving ahead for car purchases, home purchases, home remodels, all of the things, college tuition, um, and then any other savings account that you can think of. Okay, we have paid ourselves first. We have set aside money on a monthly basis. I literally have a transfer. It actually just happened today. Today I got paid and then my money shot out. I mean, you should see debit, 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 debit. And it just shoots out into all of these seven different savings accounts. And it's so fun when it happens because I open up my account and I just see my car account is growing. My home, I'm doing a home remodel. I'm, I'm, we're remodeling our bedroom, but not till we have the money saved. It's, I see those accounts growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. It is so much fun. Have separate accounts and name them. I name all of my accounts. So it's a, it's a fantastic way to do it. Okay, next, step three. What you need to do is account for all your bills. When you're doing this math, okay, this much amount of money is coming out of my paycheck to pay myself first. Here is what is left in my take-home pay. Now I'm subtracting all of the money on a monthly basis that is going to all of my different savings accounts. And then I've got my bills. Subtract all of your bills. Folks, if you have your bills already, so if you're creating your bills, create them around the budget you just set up. But if you are in an iterative process after tonight and you're trying to make this financial plan and it's just not working, it is probably here in the bills. It is probably your home mortgage. It is probably car payments. It is probably some big ticket items. And this is where I promise you, make the big decision. Make the big decision. I have never met somebody who downsized a home so that they could do this system that has ever regretted it. Okay, <laughs> this is my favorite part. So I didn't say this at the beginning, but I actually am a very natural spender. That, that is how I got into credit card debt. It's really uh, satisfying for me to actually spend everything I have. Um, it makes me feel like I am living for today. So I'm not actually being silly about it. I actually love this part. And so my husband is a natural saver. I am a natural spender. He loves this part because he knows that we've already paid ourselves first. And so he feels comfort and fine with us spending whatever is left in our checking accounts. I love it because I love seeing, oh my God, we have two more, $200 more to spend. What are we going to do with it? So this is an amazing tool that you don't have to have a fancy budget. You're not having to account for all of your expenses. You just pay yourself first and spend the rest. This is as powerful 
as I'm making out to be because I've seen people do it. How do you spend the rest? As a spender, credit cards are not good for me because I will overspend on other people's money. I will spend a lot less money if I am watching my account balance go down. I don't care what credit cards have to offer me. I know the benefits. I do. And I'll use a credit card. I will use it on my bills. I will use it to pay my electric bill. I will use it to pay my phone bill. Because what, guess what? I'm not going to say to Verizon, hey, I'd like to pay a little bit more this month, right? I can safely spend on my bills. So I put my bills on my credit card. Everything else goes on a debit card. That's it. That is how we stay in the budget. And let me tell you, I don't care one or two or 3% cash back. I, I don't care all any airline points. I don't care what they can offer. Living within the financial plan that I created is far more financially powerful than anything a credit card can offer me. Okay. The final thing I want to mention is don't be, uh, don't underestimate the power of outside consumer influence. So, uh, I will tell you when my spending rapidly went down and we were able to get to an incredible savings rate is really when I got off social media. So I even had my own social media group. Um, I was kind of doing the influencer thing and I had thousands of people in a group. I walked away. This was incredibly powerful for me to be able to stop being tempted to spend, for people to stop telling me of ways they've invented. There are there are literally expenses that I've never even heard of that are probably out there in social media that I am glad to be ignorant of. So uh, don't underestimate it impacting your life. And if maybe some kind of backing down on social media occasionally could be helpful to help you uh, stick to the plan. And finally, I want to echo all that Chris Lynn and Megan were talking about earlier today, because you cannot overstate how important this is. You got to have your tribe. And folks, there are not a lot of women tribes out there that are talking about money. So I recommend that if you are feeling good about this group, sticking with it, this is going to be how you can find like-minded people that you can share your wins with, that you can, you know, wrestle with, like, you know, should I sell this house? Should I downsize? People who have your back, who are on a similar journey. Folks, this is not the journey most people are on. Most people are on a journey where they are actually just, uh, just, oh yeah, girl, get, you know, self-care, go do it, right? Like this is not your, that's not your tribe that's going to help you retire when you want to retire, which is a magical thing. This was a fascinating text I will never forget. It was a woman who was first generation saver. No one in her family had ever saved any money. There was never an intergenerational transfer of wealth. And in fact, this lady never made more than $45,000 a year. She was in her mid forties. She hit, this is about a decade ago. She hit this hundred thousand dollars in her retirement plan. And she texted me and she said, Oh my God, I just hit a hundred thousand dollars in my retirement plan. And I was the only person in her life that she could tell. Folks, when you hit a big milestone like that, I want you to have a group of people that you can text and be able to tell them and they won't think, well, that's a brag. No, this is the group of people right here that you should be able to safely be able to say, I just had to tell someone this because this is a big deal. I just became financially independent or I just hit, um, we just finished saving for my kids college education. Okay, so I will take some questions if we have time for them. Is that, did everybody love that as much as I did? <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you so, so much, Jesse. That was incredible. Um, I feel like I need to be Essie's poster child because I could listen to her talk all day. And as someone who has enacted this like exact plan, I can tell you that this level of organization and intention around saving and investing and spending has had just like an absolutely massive impact on mine and my partner's overall happiness. And just to, I don't know, validate a little bit of what she said, tracking spending was not something that I was super excited about doing at first. I also am the natural spender. And so I was a little bit worried that I would have some feelings of 
some guilt or feelings of fear that I might be ashamed of what I had spent money on, like hello, Amazon and every single coffee shop in my valley. Um, <laughs> or just that I would have to own that I might need to change my behavior to reach my actual goals. And I certainly did feel some of that as we started the process. And I assume, you know, Essie said this, and I felt this way for sure. I'm sure many of you do that, you know, I have always felt pretty uncomfortable talking about money. It's always been the quickest route to access anxiety for me. But what I can tell you is that I was just wildly wrong about the process and what I thought it would make me feel. Knowing that every dollar has a job that we assigned it to has been absolutely liberating. And knowing that we've identified our values and then put our spending to work to get us those things has been like as dorky as it sounds, it's been so thrilling. And so <laughs> uh, having an intentional and written financial plan has just absolutely reduced spending anxiety, my anxiety about will we have enough or will we save enough to retire, my anxiety around will we have enough to have fun along the way or how long do we have to work? All that's gone and we get to spend joyfully without guilt or fear or wondering and it's just this complete gift that I should have given myself years ago. And I just, I hope that you all will take what you learned today and implement it because I can just testify <laughs> from my own experience, you know, that as we have enacted this level of planning in our life, we feel increasingly confident um, our saving and spending is right as it should be. So we don't have to worry about our financial future. It's it's the only way to live. So thank you again to Essie. That was amazing. Wonderful information. Let's move into the question and answer. So Katie Dolly is going to help us with this too, so that we don't have to make SC have multiple jobs all at once. So Katie's going to read questions that popped up in the chat. We're going to go for about 15 minutes. We'll get as far as we can. Um, hopefully we can answer everything. So I will stop talking. Go. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us, SC. And as you can see, it's uh, why everybody loves SC when she comes to speak at the WCI conference. So we appreciate you joining us today. All right. For our first question is, should my nest egg include the value of my home when making this calculation? So I don't think so, because most people want to be able to um, stay in their homes. Um, I, we don't find that a lot of people want to change that. So then the home value doesn't really uh, add to your ability to retire. Now, some people consider this, uh, using their homes, and I kind of think this too, as kind of a a backup for a long-term care scenario. So, you know, expensive memory care, these, these things, you know, maybe tapping into the equity in the home as a, as a potential source of a very, very expensive um, kind of end of life care. But otherwise, um, you know, I, I don't include it um, in that actual net worth figure. Okay. As when you're talking about the savings percent, is that on gross or net income? Gross. And that's yeah. and, and a lot of people calculate it differently. So um there's no there's nothing wrong with calculating on net. But if you um if you apply this on net, you'll end up under saving. So that's a great clarification. Especially with the uh, high income professionals when you have a really high tax rate. <laughs> it really could impact that savings rate. Yeah. Uh, what is the percent considered high interest versus low interest in the tiers of the financial waterfall? Yeah. So I think anything over 6%, I would consider worthy of paying down. So think about it this way. Um, if someone was like, you know, I'll give you a guaranteed rate of return. You know, when I think about like a 9% uh, car uh, auto loan, if someone said to you, I'm going to give you a 9% guaranteed rate of return, like, on your money, would you take it? I mean, I would take that deal. So you're you're giving yourself a rate of return by paying off that debt. Right, it's the best investment you have. <laughs> That's right. All right, would you advise someone to max out an HSA if they have significant health issues and can benefit from a cap in healthcare expenses? For example, without a traditional health plan and a max out of pocket of 7K, health expenses would have been eight fifty would have been 15k this year. Oh yeah. So so to be clear, and this is I'm it, like I couldn't have planted a better question. And um and when I do a presentation like this, 
there is a lot of information that I can't give. And so the assumption here is that you've chosen your healthcare plan and you have an HSA available. If you've chosen your healthcare plan and it's a PPO, not an HSA eligible plan, because that's the best financial decision, which it sounds like in this case that is. No, that is a far better decision than just choosing an HSA plan for the ability to, to benefit from an HSA account. Most people are suffering under the non-decision. Like you, you don't have a choice. Like you have a high deductible healthcare plan that happens to be HSA eligible. And that has been my situation for the last decade. So you just make the best of it. So great clarifying question. Excellent. Um, in addition to budgeting and living frugally and maxing out Roth IRAs, if possible, what would be your top recommendations for students or new residents who have no to little income and rapidly accruing student loans? Great. Well, be smart on your student loans. So, um, so if you're a if you're a med student, um, these budgeting principles you can use them on your student loans. So, I talk to I love talking to med students because I really think that people can mitigate their student loans and just prevent them from being that big in the first place. If you're in residency, being smart about your student loans, like with the Save Plan, where you can actually um, have government subsidize your interest so that it's not, so your loan isn't actually growing while you're in training. So being really smart about that. And I mean, I, like I get the tingles thinking about residents saving 10% of their pay into a Roth. Um, so I love going to resident programs. And again, all these residents like are just coincidentally saving uh, 4% here or 5% there. And most of them don't even know that they're doing that. They were simply auto enrolled because that was the policy of their of their training institution. They were just auto enrolled. So don't be auto enrolled. Make your decision. An appropriate savings rate, I think, for a resident is 10 percent. Put it into the Roth option at work. You don't even have to mess with your, opening your own Roth. If you've got one available to you, just use it. It's easy. Excellent. Thank you. Um, any recommendations about high yield saving accounts? Love them. Yes. <laughs> do, do you have a favorite right now? Um, whoever is willing to pay me more money. <laughs> I mean, it's really fun. And and also look, like, um, look at where, look at all the options. So, you know, sometimes it's a CD is looking kind of good right now. I mean, you can see 6% CDs. If you don't need access to that money, um, let someone pay you a little bit more for it for holding it for a year. Um, I love uh, looking at money markets. Some of these money markets are paying um, great yields. So, so go chase it. So, you know, look at American Express High Yield, look at Discover, look at all of them, Ally, just and see whoever is willing to pay you more money right now. Do you, would you use your high yield savings account as part of the bucket system? Where I would, would for the, yeah, for the emergency fund. So the, it's it's the only one that, you know, I would park that sucker wherever you can get yield because it's one that you don't anticipate using. You don't need it. You know, you don't typically need to transfer it, you know, in and out. Um, and so for that reason, you can just uh, set up that high yield savings account. If you're putting say 300 bucks a month or a thousand bucks a month into it, if you're building it up, have an auto transfer, just an, an external account transfer, make sure that there are no fees on it, set that sucker up and, and let that thing build. And then the rest of the accounts, I do think they need to be around your checking account because you're going to need easy access to them. You're going to need to be able to transfer that money. Um, let's say you're saving up for my pair of $200 uh, or $250 uh, magic shoes that I can use for this marathon. Okay. <laughs> so I paid for them. And then I took the money out of my, I have a clothing account. I took the money out of that account, and reimbursed myself after I bought them. So that's how I use those savings accounts. So you want them really, really easy to bring to your checking accounts so that you can pay for things. Excellent. Okay, the last question that's uh, been uh, the ire of many people is any suggestions for budgeting apps now that Mint says they're not going to uh, support it after 2023? I mean, the closest budgeting app to the system, I'm, so I don't think you need a budgeting system, a budgeting app. I mean, you literally can use your own like savings accounts and checking account and literally there's your budget, right? Because you're just sending money out. <laughs> like it, you, you really don't need one because it's like, uh, I want to buy a $250 pair of shoes. Can I buy them? Is the money there in that account? 
Yes, it is. I can go buy them. So it, it really is that simple. And you get paid via interest. So you can open up all these accounts and they don't cost anything. So it's really cool. Now, if you really want a budgeting app, I think the closest thing to this is YNAB. You need a budget. It's it's tried and true. Uh, people seem to love it. But remember, even YNAB probably has like a 15% success rate. Because remember, we are not good at doing these things long term. That's why using a system of accounts and automated transfers into those savings accounts, it just works because you don't, it doesn't require you to continue doing them over and over each month. Excellent. Thanks so much, Esty, for answering those questions. We'll turn the time back over to Megan to explain our uh, breakout groups. Okay, fantastic. Thank you to both of you. That was awesome. Thanks to everybody who posted their questions. We appreciate all of that. Um, okay, so we're going to do things just a little bit differently today than we did last time. For those of you that were here, we want to allow a little bit more flexibility within the breakout groups. So we are not going to be coming back to the main room after we're done in our breakout groups. So that way, if your group wraps up a little bit sooner, no problem. If you're in the middle of a great discussion, you can finish that conversation. We also really are trying to honor and respect everyone's time. So we're going to try to make these 20, 25 minutes um, and then wrap up so that everybody can get on with their night. So as a reminder, we do not record these discussions. Only the, only the main presentation here will be recorded. So you can feel free to talk and converse without fear, fear of being recorded. Um, before we separate, I just want to let you know about a couple of little things. One is our giveaway this month. It's actually going to be happening in the Facebook group. So we are giving away a little package with two wonderful books. The first one is the White Coat Investor Bootcamp book. And the second is uh, Taking Stock by Jordan Grummet. Also, also just a fantastic book. So all you have to do is answer a question in the Facebook group. And in honor of what SC just said about celebrating with your tribe, uh, the question we want you to answer is what is a financial win or milestone you have reached in 2023? Just respond to that question in the comments and then you'll be automatically entered. If you do not have Facebook and you want to participate, you can just send an email to few at whitecoatinvestor.com and answer that same question and we'll get you entered that way as well. And then the winners will be announced and we'll reach out to you next week. Um, and then the other thing we wanted to let you know is that we are wanting to just keep in touch a little bit more and continue to provide value to you in between these events. So starting next month, we're going to be sending out um, a monthly newsletter with some educational material, stories of financial success from the women within this group, and just other things like that. So keep an eye out for that in December. We will be sending out the recording from tonight along with the slides so that you can refer back to them in the next week or two. And then that will also be in the newsletter. Um, so also don't forget, if you want to join us at WCICon, use code the few when you're checking out to get $200 off your registration price. It's good through this weekend. Can't wait to see you there. Okay, just like last time, we're going to have a couple of WCI staff members in each of the breakout rooms to help ask some questions, get things rolling. But of course, feel free to discuss whatever feels relevant. This is your time to talk with your peers and colleagues about whatever it is that you want. So we'll have some prompts to help you if it's still helpful, if it feels helpful, but this is your time. So thank you all again for being here. It was so wonderful to see all of you and we hope you have a wonderful holiday season and we will see you back here in January. And as always, if you have any questions, concerns, comments of any kind, please feel free to email us at few at whitecoatinvestor.com. And so in just a second here, you'll see a prompt pop up on your screen. You just click join. It'll take you to your breakout group and have a great discussion. Thanks so much for being here. The hosts of the White Coat Investor are not licensed accountants, attorneys, or financial advisors. This podcast is for your entertainment and information only. It should not be considered professional or personalized financial advice. You should consult the appropriate professional for specific advice relating to your situation.